This tape is part of the Middle Tennessee Oral History Collection designated as MT2000.168. Uh, this is Betty Rowland. Today is Friday, April 4th, 2003. I'm interviewing John Tucker at his home located in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. The tape of this interview along with the transcription of the interview will become part of the MTSU Oral History Collection and will be available to the public. Future researchers may include portions of this interview in their publications. Is that all right with you, Mr. Yes, Tucker? That's all right. Sure. Okay. We'll just get a few things uh, on the record, mm -hmm. and let me get a reading on your voice. Uh, I'll ask you to state your full name. Uh, John H. Tucker. Okay. Is, what does that H stand uh, okay, for? Okay, you said the full name. John Henry Tucker. John Henry. Henry okay. Tucker. Okay. Uh -huh. That's a great name. Um, and your place of birth? Oh. Uh, Tennessee. Okay. And your date of birth? Uh, 12-21-26. Okay. Your father's name? My father's name was Benny, Benny James Tucker. What did he do for a living? The farm. He mm. did the farm. Uh -huh. You grew up on a farm? Yeah. You're a farm boy. And your mother's name? Ida. Ida Tucker. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Did she work outside no, the home? No, just housewife. She had her hands full. You said you had brothers. Twelve children, twelve, six boys and six girls. My goodness, where did you fit in that lineup? I was, I was the, uh, uh, the tenth one. I fit down. I went down. I was the tenth one in the family. One of the babies. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. When anybody asked me well, how far was I down, I, but I, I tell them it's twelve, and I was the tenth one. Oh wow, yeah. that's great. Um, so you've got memories growing up on a farm. That's right. Right. Did you have well, chores? I didn't, uh, well, after I got grown, then I, I, I left off. Uh, yeah, but growing up, did growing you have up. chores? Have what? Did you have chores? Oh, yeah. So we learned a whole lot. We learned d discipline. That was the best thing that uh, 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 that you learn when you're at home, mm -hmm. is discipline. And my family did believe in, in discipline. They, they just didn't believe in, then uh, then, then they would tell us, uh, you know, certain people would say bad things, I don't want you around them. And that was good. So in the long run, it paid off. I seen, I seen what they're talking about, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at the young people of today. I shakes my head. They out in the, when they get out of school, they're out in the middle of the street, about sixteen people, standing, and cars have to stop each way. And then they finally decide to move over and let them, you know, let them and let them pass by, you know. We didn't do that. We was told any if anybody seen us. Out of all of it, they'd come back and tell your parents, and boy, you have had it, you know. So I think that's what needs to be done today. But I don't know the young people of today because I've been in and out of Tennessee because I lived in Michigan quite a while. I even worked in, a, in Michigan in the factory also up until I went in, until I got ready to go in service. And I, what you didn't mind, I didn't mind going because uh, everybody was laid off. The streets just full of people laid off in the, in the factory. So when that time came for me to go in service, so I just said, well, I will have a job for the next two years anyway, you know. Mm -hmm. I always, you know, like to work. I didn't like to just, you know, stand around doing mm -hmm. not anything. So. Now you tell me that you had three brothers who served in World War II. It was five, yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, no, five. In World War II? No, no, three in World War II. Uh-huh, yes. And the two of us in Korean War, uh -huh. me and my baby brother. Tell me your memories of your brother serving in World War II. Okay, I'll go to my brother, Jesse. Uh, he was uh, always worked, worked uh, did highway work when they were building highways, and then he got his papers to go in and serve. So he was drafted in in the early part of, uh, i say around 42 or 43. And, and was drafted into the into the army, and he went in uh, as an infantryman. He went to all. Oh, he named all of the countries. He went to France, Germany, Italy, mm -hmm. and all those places. And then come down to my brother Al, Al Tucker. He was drafted in. He was a highway. He was working the highway with the, with his brother Jesse, also. And then he was he was drafted in, and uh, he was uh, he went into the engineer in the army. Mm -hmm. Army engineers, they built, you know, bridges, mm -hmm. those custom bridges and things like that. And uh, he was all, he was uh, also, uh, he always talked about Casablanca, Africa, Germany, and France. Because he always came back trying to, trying to speak to us, uh, tell us about his speaking France, you know, and all of that. And then my brother, uh, Benny, he was in World War, World War II. 
he was uh, he went into the service, was drafted into the service, and he become a first cook. In in the uh, he was also in the uh, engineer, mm -hmm. and uh, so his his men all they go out and, you know build bridges and things, and uh, he was the he was the first cook because I remember they came through Tennessee and were maneuvered somewhere in Tennessee. And, oh, he uh, did maneuvers here in t Middle Tennessee. Middle Tennessee. Because mm -hmm. I was going to school at Holloway, mm -hmm. and I got out of school and was uptown, and I looked, and here come a convoy of trucks. I said, well, wait, look at you on here come a... And somebody hollered at me and waved and said, I'll, I'll see you all tomorrow, and that was my brother. And then they got a jeep and came back and came and came came back to uh, back over the over uh, came back to see us in Murfreesboro, and I thought that was the best thing. So what they was doing, they would go to uh, Florida in the winter, and go to Michigan most of the time in the summer because he was at uh, Battle Creek, uh, Michigan. Because that's why when he got when he got out of service, that's why he wanted to go back and get a job and work at Ford. He always talked about Ford. And he got a job also and retired and uh, mm -hmm. fold. So, and then, okay, come down to my brother, uh, Etzel, that was my baby brother. He, and what was his name? Etzel Fold, Tucker. And then he got a job easily at Fold when he went back. Because mm -hmm. he brought out and the man told me to hold that young man. He ran my car's name, Fold, his middle initial. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have no problem getting no job. So he went, he went in the medics in the army, but he was stationed with the Air Force. I thought that was kind of strange. Wherever they went, he went to the, uh, Alaska. Fairbanks, all over, wherever the Air Force went, he went, because he was a medic. Mm -hmm. And uh, he enjoyed that job, and by being in the medics, I thought so when he would, you know, would get out that he would go, you know, to the hospital. No, he chose to go to Foles, and he got a job at Foles. After he went there and wrote his name down, and then one of the, the guys, the top men, says to hold that young man, that's how he ran my car's name. So he'll get a job if nobody else don't get one. Mm -hmm. So then he stayed at uh, 30 years with uh, with Folds and uh, then retired and uh, he didn't he didn't last a year after that. He just it's hard just look like he just splattered just killed him right there. Then myself, uh, uh, I uh, I was called to go into the service cause which I, like I said we all had been laid off in the factory in which it didn't matter. So. Uh, but yet I came to Tennessee to go in order to go from the state of Tennessee. So I went in from I went in from Nashville, Tennessee, and was sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and for basic training. And uh, when we got there, so now this is in 1950. So we've moved to the Korean War now. Korean War, yeah. I'm yeah. talking about yeah. But Etzel was yes, that's what he was in the Korean War. Uh -huh. My big brother Etzel, and then I I was in in the, in the Korean War, but Etzel went to Alaska. Uh -huh. Not the Korean War, which I was glad of because it was two brothers went there and in the Korean War and they both got, it was twins, both got killed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, now, did you join the service or were you drafted? I was, I was drafted. Okay. Service, uh -huh. And uh, I remember, I remember good, my father had that long letter and brought to me and said, oh my goodness, he said, I don't know what's wrong here, but it looked like something was going wrong. He gave me the letter and I opened it. It looked like a serious The bad letter. part was about it. Your friends and neighbors have chosen you. I said, who in the world have chosen you? You know, so I said, well, I'm going. It doesn't matter. I said, that make, that make, that will extend the number that how many of us, of, of us was in service. Now, you're uh, being born in 26. You you were a little too young for World War II. Two, right. right. Yeah. The only, thing, the only thing that happened in World War II a bunch of us was in high school. Mm -hmm. We decided when school was out, about five of us, we were going, we were going to join the army. And we was told if you pass, you will get 30 days back home. Mm -hmm. We go all the way to Mississippi somewhere to Fort Camp Shell, Mississippi, and pay everybody pass, and they were finna load us up and kill us to Atlanta to Fort Benning, Georgia, and we started hollering like. That guy said, you mean we have a bunch of babies here starting out? So they told him, said, so load them back up and send them on back home. You know, I knew it here from, I knew that we, all of us, never did hear no more from that until the Korean War. <laughs> we did, I mean, they didn't send back for us. We, I wanted what happened. Uh -huh. We just un, uh, were making sure that they promised us if we passed, that we could come back home and stay uh, 30 days and then go. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, 
I don't know how, what happened that, but that next time came when they sent that letter mm -hmm. that you were introduced into the armed forces. So your friends and neighbors have chosen you. And I, I'm wondering the rest of the day who were those friends. And <laughs> so where did you go for I went, induction? I went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Fort Jackson, South Carolina. We till we got in there, and they told us that uh, everybody. Now we went over the limit in training. We went the whole 16 weeks. Oh, you went over the limit. Well, over the limit, I mean, that was because uh, 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 the war was in Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, and a whole outfit had got it. Right. So we were told that you had better learn everything. Learn ever pay attention to everything and learn everything. So where you were going, so I know you you have an idea you're going, uh, you're going to another theater, but you say you're going to the Far East Command. And, they, and he said, and that's Korea. And I said, oh, my goodness. I, I, I had my finger crossed, hoping that it wouldn't be Korea. A little serious. But that time before we got finished base training and the paper, we were looking at the paper where our whole outfit had got wiped out. And I said, oh my goodness, I don't want to go. I don't want to go there, but uh, we had no choice. I said, I'll just have to take it, you know. Um, because you were drafted, did you have, did you get a choice as to what outfit you went into? No. No? <laughs> no. Oh, they, they had, uh, you know, that was uh, kind of Kind of hard in a way that we had guys that were preachers, but they did uh, before they did, before, after we got to California, they complained it so until they decided to put them in another, in another, and, and take them out of the infantry. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we had one. I don't know how in the world he got all the way into Korea. He was walking along there with his rifle pointed down the ground. So, he, so his religion uh, don't allow him to kill. And I tried my best. I said, why don't you all uh, get rid of this guy? Send him out of here. Back to another, some other outfit that uh, he said, and uh, you know, I, I don't know what happened to that guy. I really don't. I, I wish I could have, I wish I could have kept in mind uh, about what, what happened to him, but he's walking along there with his, his rifle pointed down at the ground. Hmm. Well, you wound up in Company L, 15th F Infantry Regiment in Regiment. Korea. And third division. Third division. We got Korea. there. We got there. The guy that came out, what few was in the uh, in the 15th Infantry Regiment, came out with clapping hands and said, "Well, you all is our replacement." Says, uh, "This is what was left. What? But I guess a dozen men." My. I says, "Oh my goodness!" Well, we all came around. He said, "Told us to gather around. Said we're going to assign, assign you." Called my name. I said, "Wonder what they gonna give me." So one guy was there, he uh, thought he knew me. He was a sergeant. He could he could just he just really believed he knew. he said, I'd rather for you to be with me, he says if you want to be with me, he said we are we are with the anti tank weapon. Well I had no choice. He said, You don't want no machine gun. He said he says Dang, but that uh, then I find out that, well the uh, anti tank gun was danger is just as dangerous as the, as the, as the machine gun. Well, well, matter of fact, all of them were because you, you were walking facing the enemy, regardless of whether you had a BAR, M1, or what, you're still going forward. Mm -hmm. And you're facing all of that that is coming in at you, you know. So, uh, well, I went on with the anti tank weapon. So, what we had was a, you build a, you make a dugout over here, and a dugout over there, and a dugout over there, and then you get in your hole and stand and you pick your targets, and you fire that uh, anti tank weapon. It's a very dangerous weapon. You walk behind it, you might as well walk it out and get out in front of it. The back, the back blast mm -hmm. will just really, will just, it just mess you up. So, uh, well, and uh, so I, when I got there, I asked the guy, uh, the position put me in. I said, well, what happened to this guy in the position I'm getting in? He didn't mind telling me. He said, oh, yeah. You know, he said he got sent back in a, in a, uh, 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 back in a, in a bag, plastic bag or something like that. I said, well, good Lord, I better quit asking, asking questions. You know, he said, he didn't mind telling me. He said, oh, you got sent back in a bag. Yeah. So I said, So well, you knew this was a dangerous position. That, it was, it was. Because see what would happen when you fire that uh, anti-tank gun, it said at a back blast, it, it's a blaze come from it. Yes. And you fire and you leave in a hurry and, 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 and jump in the other position. And then look back where you left from, and then I'm plastered that whole area with artillery. And I tell the guy, I said, our object is hit and run. I said, if we'd have stayed 
we all would have been wiped out. You hit and run to your other position. So I said, well, good Lord. I said, they told me this wasn't a danger. Yes, it was. And any tank weapon, go, they see that blaze coming from it. They know this is a danger weapon, and they're going to really try to get on you. With yeah, that. and they can spot you. Uh -huh. It's easy to spot you. Had you been trained on that weapon? Oh, yeah. See, uh, in uh, Carolina, you turn your back, and here's a, uh, a building back here. Then you fire that thing. You look every time to that, that just um, blow the door down and burn down the door in there. So that's why they tell you not to ever walk behind one. There was a guy walked out behind one in a career, didn't know he was fine. And uh, oh, it just burned all that had face. You know, he just, he just in a bad shape, you know. So, mm. so good Lord, look at him. He didn't know they was fine, uh, that, that, that uh, anti tank gun was going to be fired. So he just was going from one era to another, you know. So. Tell me some of your experiences in Korea. Well, my... Were you on the move a lot? All the time. We were shifting from from the uh, eastern, the western, or uh, the northern front. We would be, we would uh, would get orders that we had to pull back and uh, and shift over. And we we did a lot. We stayed on the move. All the time. And those hills, those hills were so high. Like I should tell people when I'm talking to them that you you up there in the air. You know, ain't no such thing as you no know, too much flat terrain. You up there and, and up, up is up in the air. So uh, was it cold? It was cold. Cold. The guys had uh, before I got there and got there, they had the feet. He went back to the doctor, and he just took a pair of tweezers and the toe just popped off. Called that a trench foot, you know. And then when you get to a stream of water, I was hoping. I said, I wonder what in the world is going to happen when we get to this stream of water and one guy said you'll find out we got there we had to go on across that water hit me right under the right under the lip and all i did was help the weapon up to keep it from getting wet you know and then when you come out of there you couldn't even tell your name you were so cold you i mean i mean you couldn't tell what squad you was in you'd ask your men what squad are you in couldn't it was just just cold just chilly inside you know you could and uh then uh we would a whole lot of time would get all this, like I said, that we're going to have to shift from the uh, from the eastern front to the western front, and then we would we would, would shift and go there and go there, and it was it, we was in trouble because that, that's why the enemy looked like was really in that in that particular era. Then uh, we went started to go across a bridge, and uh, the enemy started artillery started hitting, and and I took off running and uh, dived off. The right side is really way down there on the ground. See from getting hit. Then some of the other guys jumped off at the other end, and the enemy was under there waiting on. Oh, now it was just now. I, you see how lucky I was not to jump off at that end where those other guys jumped off, and they just ripped them from down here all the way up. With it. see, they got a burp gun. He just stand. Oh, what in. kind of gun? Burp gun. That's burp. A burp. Okay. A burp gun. That's like a, it's it's automatic. It's around. Uh -huh. They went to put the ammunition in a round thing, and they just stand there and just, just, just it, you can tell it from your weapon, uh, they just, burr, burr. when it hit that one once or twice, you got a whole lot of slugs in you. Oh my goodness. And uh, I was so glad that I jumped off at the other end, and come out up down the other end, and I'd look back to see where the other guys was, and they were out there laying out there, they just jumping, and I'm turning the burp guns loose on them, and uh, then uh, i tell you another Okay, then we had to go to on the, uh, was fixing to go on the outpost. Now the outpost is, uh, you go out, you out front of the line. You go out on the outpost. Mm -hmm. You all sit out there, so we got called not to go and let this other outfit went in. You know, that was another lucky night. We sit there in the line and looked at, uh, uh, looked at what happened to the outpost. See, this enemy came in and surrounded the whole outpost. And started up there, up there on them. That father observer had his radio and called back to the FDC for 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 artillery. And you can hear the uh, FDC says, "Sir, I'm sorry, you calling this on your own self." And he said, "Well, why, where in the H do you think the enemy is at? You know, you just blow just blow it up at all of him and his all 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 of the men too." We went out there the next day, the next morning, to go out there to uh to uh, try to overcome the 
and see what happens at Outpost and Pact all them guys. It's all got to wipe out. That's then I, I was telling some of the guys, I said, they have a German, uh, I mean Russian uh, guys helping them to to lead in this war. Some guys said, oh, that's not no, that's not no Russian. Another guy come up and said, look at that. They are the Russians. He was taller than the, uh, than the North Korean. And I had her add that uh, telephone on his back. You know, why he can call in to his people to call in uh, in artillery. So uh, it was something else. And we went out there at that outpost and and then the uh, And that's where you that's where your uh, company should have We were supposed to go out there. We were supposed to, supposed to go, there. but somebody else went they oh held to us up and sent somebody else out. Oh my goodness, you must have and you must have felt like that was a lucky and then that Decision. night after they got all those people out up there that was dead and what few were wounded, then we went in and, and, and moved in. And that night, the, the uh, communication went off. I said, oh, my gosh. Guys up there trying to call from one, two, three, four, four platoon. One, two, three, four. Couldn't get nobody. Then that set the, the communication man right there, and so they told him to pick anybody you want Two in the morning, you put your hand up in front of you, came all to see your hand. And he came by and and asked me what I go. You go where? Go down to find out what oh. had happened to the line. I said, oh my goodness, this guy, that'd be kidding me. I'm not a, a communication. So I just said, well, okay, I'll go. All you had was a password. That password was silver dollar. We went on off down there and went through that orchard. What well, trees and land was your hand? I, I still couldn't even. We went way off down there, and he finally found the wires, got a hold to it, and kept. And I tell him to hurry up. So the way I had him walking, he was in front of me, and I was over this way. Mm -hmm. I said, "If anything jump up, hit the ground quick, 'cause I'm gonna just cut out everything, and, and them weeds is up around here." So you were carrying a weapon. Well, and if weapon. he hit the ground, you were gonna so start hit, shooting. Cut, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna cut out everything that's in front, in in, in front of me. He went on, went on, found. So he said, hey, it is ready. It's been, the line had been cut. And they was long in there somewhere then. He went on. I said, hurry up and fix that. Hurry up and fix that. See, what he had to do, he had to fix the line. And then he had to plug up and call everybody and see if they had the communication. And then he called everybody and I said, hurry up, let's get out of here. So we left and uh, heading back up to the line. We got so far up there and I started hollering the password. I heard one of me and said, listen. I said, those. So, that, so those are Koreans trying to speak English. And I just kept talking, talking. I said, I just tell me we left here an hour and a half ago. I said, no, we are returning. I kept hollering the parish. Well, we got up there, and the guy said, I knew that was you. I said, man, because the guy that was saying, he, he was saying, that, that's not them. I said, them is enemies. I said, speaking English, you talking about a guy, he never missed nothing, a uh, target. So some nights he would tell me, he said, if you want to go to sleep, to go on sleep, he said, you know, if a net would fly by, I would knock him out of there, and he wasn't kidding. And, uh, well, the next morning we got a call to to pull pull out, and, uh, and we was going to be shifted to see we were on the go all the time. She shipped to another front. Okay. Here come about five or six of us. We come on down ahead of the rest of them and went on through that, uh, all that same area we, we went through that night. We got on through, then the rest of them come on down. All of them came down. Do you know them people that are planted in that thing, planted in that, it's so heavy, and they, they, they and, and they killed a whole lot of people. And they let us go in there at night and fix that wire and come back. All they had to do was walk out behind one of them trees and oh, grab me around and naked. They were there. They was there. Oh, okay. But they let, sometimes they let you go through in order to get everybody. Oh, my goodness. And we got a call out there that we was ahead of the rest of them to, to uh, Return back, said, your, your outfit is on, is, have been ambushed. I said, well, we went back, and, and, and them people was all in there. He had, I told, went back to this guy. I said, don't you ever tell me to go with you no more to fix no, uh, to uh, fix a wire at night. I said, that's my job, no way. I said, that's your job. You get somebody else that's in your outfit to, to go and help you with these wires. And uh, he didn't do them a laugh, you know. So, I tell you that was that was I said myself that was the luckiest. Uh, the good Lord was with me and and him. They let us through and let, and, and, uh, and 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 let us come back to go back up there. But the next day we got ambushed. The rest of them did. That was behind us got ambushed and they, and they let about five or six of us go on through that day. 
that when all the rest of them started coming down with all of the guns and the packs and everything, they come out of that with them burp guns, started ripping them up. Were there a lot of casualties in your unit? It sounds like when you got there that there had been a lot of casualties. It, it was. You know, you know, we, we, we continue to have a whole lot of casualties. A lot of time that artillery would, would come in and hit right in the middle of your uh, bunt stand. That would knock down. Just like uh, the time I got hit, uh, I guess it was about everybody except me and another guy. And uh, and the guy that I had told, we, had, we, t we, we would tell each other that if you get killed, you go back and tell my parents, I call them, we give them each other phone numbers and address. The guy that told me to tell his parents, he was, he was from California, and uh, that guy, when the, when the Reds started to shelling, shelling that area, and uh, see, I had a tendency, see, you supposed to be down at all times. When you had the gun go off and your head coming, you, you supposed to be down. I used to run and then dive and jump, but if I'd have dived that time, that'd have been my last dive. That's why that round hit. I figured that out. What if I said I, I? And me and this guy went down together, and that guy and, and that that shrapnel hit him and just over his intestines just rolled out. And he turned over to tell me, he said, "Tell so and so." That was it. You know, I said, "My gosh!" I said, "I got him," but I, I after I got wounded, uh. I got back. I was in such bad shape I couldn't call nobody. You know, I had lost. Matter of fact, everything I had, my bill fold and everything, uh, I didn't have it when I got to to Japan. They didn't have any any of my really really important things that uh, that I had. So a lot of time uh, when you get wounded, or what they did when I got wounded, I was bleeding so. And this medic, now they played a good role. He just took a knife and just cut my clothes off of me. Then he was said, oh my goodness, and the other medics looked at him and told him, don't do that. And I was thinking, said, what's wrong? What's wrong? And then when I got hit in the eye, my whole eye was hanging all the way down. And then we, everybody wore a first aid pouch. Now, did all of the injuries come at the same time? Same time, okay. yeah. And uh, he took my first aid pouch off and put it up and pulled the eye back up there and put it up around Pull around a band and it wasn't long the medics because I mean, the medics. Oh, he it. used your pouch to hold your yeah, eye. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Put okay. the, yeah, everybody had a pouch on the on the side. If you get, uh, especially if uh, something get hit and it's not coming down, you put that up there and put it, put and put it back on. Then the medics, the medics really do a good job. They give you a pain and shot and and they get you ready and then get a a jeep, it's an ambulance jeep we call it. It's just. Put you on a ladder and slide you up in there, you know, and try to get you out of there. Cause uh, how long did it take for them to get you out of there? Do you it, remember? It, it was a short time. It, it, yeah. it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. That's the reason I say the medics did do a good job. And uh, uh, I had uh, saved three guys. We had all this, a lot of time to leave the wounded behind. Things were getting so rough. You just keep going. Just leave the wound. But I told the guy, I said, take my weapon. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to try to get some of these guys out of here. So I did. I, and uh, my commander came to me one day. He said to me, he said, you know what? He says, uh, you are helping save people. And one of these days, somebody going to save you. That's just, that's just what he said. We, we had a West Point. He was a, that was a smart guy. He knew. He didn't Who was he? Do you well, remember his name? Uh, uh Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Ball. Ball? Ball. B A L F. Lieutenant Ball. You talking about a smart, he got everything that uh, a, a wall person was supposed to get, you would get it. Mm -hmm. Anything, he would he would get everything, everything that you had to have, he would get it for you. And uh, then this guy could read maps good. He never did go in the wrong area. Some, a lot of outfits I, were, I was looking at went in the wrong area, and that was the biggest, biggest mistake uh, oh. they ever made, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so, uh, did you have good maps? Well, do you think they were good? A or? lot, of, yeah. A lot of times you just learn what you could by y yourself, you know. Well, I've interviewed some people that were in Korea, and they said that that they didn't always have good maps, and you just kind of had to find yeah, things on but, your own. But we had interpreters. Oh, okay. Korean. Just we had about five interpreters. Uh huh. Yeah, all of them were really true. They'd help you. 
Mm -hmm. We had one, except one. Uh, a little old guy we called, we called him Scotia. He's supposed to be 13 years old. So one day, uh, uh, I had the radio there closed, and I heard the enemy voice coming on it. And then I asked him, what did they say? He said, I don't, I don't know. But yet still, he was running to get in a hole. Uh. And then it wasn't long, the artillery started pounding in on our out, outfit. So we said, we go out to get rid of him. So he knew that, that they was calling the fire on us, and he, he said he and didn't he, know. You and know, he didn't so tell you. He didn't tell us. Uh -huh. Let me turn this. Sister Nashville, she looks at this on TV, and she said, that's really awful. I told her, what you're looking at, that's, that's the situation we was in. You mean you was in all of it? I told her, all them tanks rolled along our side. I told her, we was, I said, we was, uh, infantrymen. We was the combat people. That, that, that's, and he just looked like a scared of the death. I said, hey, after all, I'm got wounded. I'm back home now. He said, you shouldn't be nervous, you know, now. But she didn't know I was, you know, was in that kind of situation. Well, for so many of us, until, uh, until technology has made it possible for us to watch this this war that's going on in Iraq, now we can watch it on television. But we've only read about it in books, yeah. and we've seen yeah. still pictures, and so it's hard to imagine what you experienced. Uh -huh. It must have been, it must have been frightening. Every oh, it, it was. Day. I, like I, just like I was telling her, I said, I'm not holding nothing. But I said, you could almost hear guys' hearts pounding, you know. But some of the guys said to me, uh. You, I don't believe you were afraid. Say so every time, uh, they didn't believe you were afraid. Yeah, they said I don't, I don't believe. I told them, look, we all see. I, I just, you couldn't just say you were afraid. You know, if you want to keep your men to stay with you, so somebody may get scared and leave. You know, mm -hmm. I told them we all here to do a job, and let's just stick together and look out for each other, and we'll go back to America. And so that's, I just, we'll just tell them I'd get them like a football squad, and just sit down and tell them a whole lot of things that. Uh, that uh, I said, everybody's here to do their job, and I said, we're going to have to do the job. So every time when we get ready to go in that tough battle, I always heard my name called to front and center. That's go to the company man. And he'd give you he'd give you what you have to do. And then I went back, and uh, some of the guys said, what's wrong? What's wrong? But, well, what are we supposed to do? I turned and just looked up. I didn't say a word. I just looked up at the hard break ridge. You mean, I said, that's the idea. I said, drop everything you've got except your ammunition and your weapon. Drop your cargo pack. See, everybody had a cargo pack. Awesome. What, what was a cargo pack? That's a, that's a little, uh, it's a little handy thing that you can, whatever uh, souvenirs you get from the enemy, you can put it in that. Oh, okay. And, uh, but the funniest thing it was, one guy went in his pocket and come out with it. He had some teeth, gold teeth. He done took his 45 and cook, 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 knocked them teeth out of, it, of, the out of the dead mm -hmm. mouth, you know, and mm -hmm. keep them. You know, I said, well, good Lord. That's the first time I ever seen this uh, thing like this to happen. And uh, now you take the Hardbreak Ridge. That was, that was awful. With a, whole, a whole outfit had got uh, wiped out on that, on that hill. And there we are sitting in reserve, just as pretty weight. All of us came down that the 15th Infantry Regiment of the 3rd Division will take that hill. I said, oh my goodness. When they brought the dead out up there before we moved out, they, you know what a big old army truck, the 6 by mm -hmm. they were piled up in there like they can canned hogs and slaughtered the dead. The dead? Oh my and goodness. And I said, well, good. No, they bringing all them trucks right by us. And you looking at all them people piled up in there, just piled all the way up. And I said, oh, my goodness. And they said, well, they said, your outfit will go out and you will take the hill. So we moved out and we went on and we went out there. And I mean, we, uh, I seen a guy's helmet, a steel helmet laying. I said, good Lord, this guy was running. He done run out of his helmet. His head was in that helmet. Then I seen a boot. He wear them boots. And I seen a boot laying. I said, this guy sure was running. He run out of his, his that was a leg in that. In that, when we just jump over it and keep going, you know. Oh, Mr. Tucker, yeah, you saw oh, yeah, terrible thing. Yes, sir. So, uh, we just had a job to do, and you didn't stand there and weep and moan because the guy got killed or nothing like that. And you have to say to yourself, That could have been me because it ain't no time for feeling, you know, sorry. You was in trouble trying to uh, defend yourself. Is this the battle that you were wounded in? 
Uh, or was it later that you were wounded? Yeah, uh, that was uh, that was uh, west of uh, not, uh, that battle was the one I got wounded in was the west of Chowan. Now that was a. Uh, let me tell you what happened that that uh, evening when we got when we got on this hill. Is this heartbreak? Heartbreak Ridge. Ridge, uh, okay. When we got on that on that on that hill up there, and probably we could see see way over there at the enemy, and you and what you could see was a whole convoy of enemy uh, bringing the artillery and everything in to put in place. We tried to get contact with the air, but it had rained and it was foggy, and that word we got that no planes cannot go out. And they pulled all of it in that night and, and got it set up. About two in the morning. They started they started to try and out and see how what they had. They fired that artillery and it come right over our position. I said, Oh my goodness. I said, Now this sh shouldn't have ever happened. Uh, I wish it was possible the Air Force could have come in and uh, and stopped all of this. And they brought all brought all of that in in uh, it, it um uh, and that hill was so was so bad till we were losing was losing a whole lot of people on that on that Hardbrook Ridge. And uh so it was so many had got wounded, we had to almost turn around and and, and, and stop what we were doing, try to help get the wounded out of there. Went on I ordered some of the guys, let's go get them guys that's wounded out of here, let's get out of here. And we tried, but it just didn't work. One of them rounds came in, and, and the guy was on the litter that we were trying to get out also, and that shell had to come down and, and just blow it up everything. And, that, and I looked around the guy that had leg, his leg barely was hanging. And, and that round hit again, and he got hit again, and he, he died, you know. I said to myself, the guy been hit once, now he's been hit again, now he's dead. You know, that's just the way I was saying, you know. And uh, so we stayed there and battled and battled and battled, and and kept going forward, and battling, then, oh, we started losing a whole lot of people. And it wasn't too long, uh, the group I had, all of that got uh, just wiped out, but one or two, including myself, I got hit by it because I didn't know nothing uh, when I got hit. I just, you know, I, uh, I, got, I got the concussion of that uh, artillery shell, and you get the concussion of that too bad, it, it's just kill you, right? Kill so you. you were still firing that big artillery gun at this point? Yeah, still trying, trying to, trying to, trying to, trying to uh, knock out those machine gun uh, mm -hmm. nests up there. So that's you stayed with that gun. Stayed with it, right? Stayed with it. Mm -hmm. Well, the one that wasn't with them was it was getting the same. They, uh, see, the enemy was right there, and I will tell you something else. They had some big old rocks. Let me see what side about. Bigger than that thing that's sitting in the floor, they already up there, and they would just roll all them rocks down there on you. You you trying to get up there, rolling them big rocks down, and then they had those long hand grenades called the potato masters. Slap one of them down and try to, and try to get you also. See, they had to vanish because they was already up there, on that hill. And we lost a whole lot of guys. So after I got wounded and I got sent out of that to, uh, they sent me back to the rear. I ain't no. Uh, that nurse told me, said, said you've been said you've been out three days. And then when I did wake up, I looked, it was all I could see was foreigners in the in the hospital. Foreigners. Foreigners. <laughs> then the nurses came and said, I'm I'm a so and so, I'm from America. I said, Oh no, you're not. I said, You are I said, you are Russian. I, said, I thought I was in the wrong hospital. Thought I couldn't see nothing but foreigners. Then they came up and said, We are from America and said we we are here to try to help you, and I said, "Oh no, y'all are." I said, "Y'all are not no American. Y'all are farmers. I mean, Russian." When I thought they were Russian, I was laying there in the bed. I still didn't believe it. They, so they did what they were doing, and going. And I looked, laying there in the bed, looking down the hall, and here come a high-ranking officer. I said, "Oh my gosh, I'm on the American side, an American doctor." He come to tell me we're going to fly you out of here, try to get you out of here in an hour's time, and get you into Japan. And we go try now, to. That's the. The wounds that sent you to Japan. Uh huh. Okay. Said, he said we go. He said we go try to try to save you. We got to Japan and we stayed there so long. We got there. I still wasn't satisfied in uh, in Japan. I still wanted to get out of there. Get all the way out of there, back heading back to, towards America. And, you know. So they told us we had to stay there for a couple of weeks to to dress your wounds and make sure everything's all right. And then they put you back on the plane and 
and then we went to Midway that dropped down there and we'd stay a couple of weeks and address the wounds and make sure that you get something to eat and everything and then they put you in there again you go to high water and stay there for two or three weeks and dress the wound but got there was, I looked down out of that plane I was laying there in brick where I could look down and seen uh seen all that pretty water out there and, uh, and I looked at people was out there swimming I said out there swimming I said in Korea was uh 15 below zero and uh got there and got out it was 80 degrees is that Hawaii? In Hawaii, <laughs> 80 degrees. The uh, the triple hospital in in uh, in Hawaii, and uh, triple X, I believe that's what the name of. And we stayed there and stayed there. I said, Oh my gosh, I like this. This is warm, nice and warm. And then they would stay there so long. Then they put you in there again, and, and we were in there at time nine and ten hours. Mm -hmm. And then they would then they fly you from Hawaii to California. And we stayed there. Uh, about three weeks and then uh, put you in the air again and you, then we, they sent us to Texas to uh, Brooks General Hospital. They said the best hospital in the, in, in the, in the country. Mm -hmm. So they were, were really uh, were really save you, save your life for that. So I went there and, uh, and uh, at Brooks General Hospital, that's where that's the hospital I went in up there. And they had some good doctors there too. Nurses and doctors. Mm -hmm. and so so I really, I said, well, I said, maybe I'll, I will make it. I'm back in America now. I said, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I will live now. But, uh, but at the meantime, then in Japan, this uh, Turk, he was, I guess, down on the ground in prone position. A model dropped down, closed, and just split his head open. That guy was raised and saying, I want to go back, back to his outfit. Oh, when he was in Japan, he in was Japan, wanting he wanted to go, go back, back to, to Korea, Korea? To, to go back to them Turks. Oh, that's his nationality? It was yeah, Turkish? Yeah, they were Turkish. Oh, okay. See, those guys are... See, we got pinned down with a machine gun by women. I mean, you I mean, I mean, you would, you could almost feel the, the heat over your back that they were fine, fine. So, but finally we got that... Uh, they were women? Women. We got that... And that, uh, that, reason I said, that reason I got to ask the question of why wasn't none of our women fighting, you know. And, uh, Turkish women? No, no. Korean. North Korean. North Korean North, women. North Korean women. And uh, finally, we set that uh, 50, put that anti tank weapon up and, and fired it uh, and uh, knocked them out of that out of that position. We got over there and then found out of the women. We was we were shocked. I said, "Well, good lord, those women had us eating dirt. They were fine so close, you know." And uh, then that Turk. Uh, Came in that one time again, we it, we was pinned down with a machine gun, and one guy walked up, to, all he had was piano wires around his, well, his hand grenade. And he pat us on the shoulder and told us, wait, so he'd go out there and, and uh, you know, get him. I said, what's wrong with this guy? He said, you got to be kidding. He went out there and the machine gun quit firing, and I said, uh oh. So I said, they got him. Directly, hey, he come back, he had a head hanging on each, both sides, on each side. A head? He called, yeah, see, that, that's how they get. Uh, that's how they get their rank. Headhunters. I said, he had a head hanging on each side. So I said, now if that guy is that bad off, I said, let's try to keep him here with us. And he got to point and over, you know, that's where his outfit, he kept trying to tell us that's where his outfit was. Crossed over there. Yeah, he went out there and just walked up on him and took that wire and put it around and they said, a piano wire would cut your head off. I mean, just put it around. What it. nationality was he? Turkish. Turkish. Yeah. And uh, then they had another outfit uh, they called the uh, Wolfhound. You know, I met one of those guys here in Muffet, but it scared. He heard me talking, and I got to telling some guy about, I have never seen uh, the guy that we that was uh, connected with us, that was the call of themselves the Wolfhound. He looked around at me, and he said, I hear one of them right here. Right here in Muffet Bar. I said, well, I look over. Man, we got to talking. Right in there. So now what they do, after 12 but until daylight, all they do is put a bayonet in the rifle and go forward and holler and start hooping and hollering and gouging them with them and no, and no shooting. Bayonet. Next morning, we went out there and said, let's see what they did. Man, the enemy were laying there which one. All they did was ban it. Wasn't no, wasn't no shoot going there with the ban it. From twelve to daylight in the in, at night. In the, in the dark. In the dark. 
attacking with a bayonet. 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 See, we was taught how to, you know, to do bayonet fighting, but I showed a guy, I said, from bottom here to that wall there, I said, that's the closest one, go get to me. What, about 10 feet? Yeah, I said, I'm going to drop him with my, he said, well, we're supposed to be bayonet. I said, supposed to be. I said, I'm going to take this supposed to be and use my, and, and shoot that guy. I said, I can't, I'm not going to get that, because, see, they was really, uh, uh, experts with a with bayonet, mm -hmm. uh, 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 either any anything any any way you want to fight them. See, they already experienced with all of that. And I just told him, I, it may be one one thing I would make a mistake then, and he'd correct it for me and get me. You know, mm -hmm. we I mean we was taught how to walk up, and turn around, come back, and go back with the bayonet and all of that. I said, well, I don't know. I said I think I just have to use a weapon. You have to shoot him. You know, I can't get that close, you know, uh, on, on that person. Right. So, uh, your wounds when you're at Brooks a Hospital, do your wounds uh, end your career in the service? Did they discharge no, you because no, of no, 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 no. I had the hardest time getting out. Boy, that was the hardest time. I said, well, I was called in when my time started running out and said, well, we learned that you're going to, they were, I, I had a, the information to come down to the, Come down to the office to the uh, to this high-ranking officer. Want to want to talk with you? So I said, "Wonder." I said, "All out first number." I said, "Wonder what in the world he want." Were you still in the hospital at that point? I had got. I bless the women. I know. I I had got out and, and, and went to a. I was assigned to a, a four double O fifth ASU. That was just the Army Service Union. You didn't. Okay. You had very light. Do the like uh, I did. I went to. The, I was working in personnel. Okay. And uh, it was just like this. So when my time was running out, I had a. a Somebody told me, said he want to see you down there. The officer want to talk with you. Down, and I walked in down there, and uh, he looked at me and said, well, I learned you're going to stay with us. I told him, no, sir. So my time is, is uh, running out, and uh, I'm going home. Well, he said, I was hoping that you would stay with us. He says, uh, your record. I said, oh, I said what's, what's around with my record? He said, you have a, you have a good record. And uh, we want to, he said, we'd well, like to keep you. I told him, no, sir. Uh, that said, a guy over there said, when you re up, that said, a guy over there was counting all that money. Yeah, I just turned my back on him. I wasn't even thinking about that money because I had promised my mother that she wanted me out, you know. And, uh, so they paid you to re up? They pay you. Pay you a whole lot of, uh, depend, depending on how many years you're going to re up for. Yeah, they, they pay you to re up. But you turned your back on I turned money. my back on, on him and the money, you know, counting. And I continued talking to this officer. Well, he said to me, he said, well, let me ask you this. Said, do you think that it was wrong for you to go in service and, uh, and go in the war and fight? I told him, no, sir. I said, sir, if I had this to do all over, I would want the same men in the same outfit. That guy looked at me and laughed. He said, we can't get you to say nothing wrong. I told him I had a, we had a job to do. We were trained to do what we had to do. And I said, no, I wouldn't mind doing it again. But uh, then after that, I find out that a, uh, Another guy stayed, and they made a mistake, and put him on all of it, and he went back to Korea, and the guy got killed. See, I couldn't go on no, in no field or nothing. I could, matter of fact, I, I would let him. I couldn't even a weapon. Because of your eye. Everything, and then let me tell you something. Let me tell you what they almost did. When well, they had the, have you ever heard of the Longhorn maneuvers in in a, in, in a, at Fort Hood? My name is on the list to go out on maneuvers. I went on. I said, well, I'm going. I said, they told me that um, I looked and I seen a Jeep coming around there. He was throwing dust. Coming. I said, I wonder where that guy going. I wonder where is the fire. He was coming to tell, to come in to, to take me back and said that we, it was a mistake made. So you, you ain't, ain't, you're not ever uh, supposed to go back in no, in no unit that's going to go on over maneuvers. So you... You say, you may get a weapon and forget and just start thinking you're still in Korea and start. I, 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 I slapped. I said, I'm okay. I got in the Jeep and went on back. And so they told me, said, you have 30 days here at the, the camp, but take those 30 days and go home. I'm and surprised that they would have even, according to this, uh, the, the injury to your right uh -huh, eye. I uh -huh. mean, you've lost uh -huh, vision in your uh -huh, right eye. I'm surprised uh -huh. that, that they would have. But they were putting people out. Mm -hmm. 
every day they would they would give you a dis. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what did. I think some of them said no. I'm not staying. And I'm, it's no use. And they give them a. If you get a, what do you call it? BCD bad conduct. No, uh, you get a dishonorable discharge. They take everything away from you, your clothes and all, and give you a, a civilian suit and a hat, and mm -hmm. pay you the rest of your money, and you, and you go home. Guys are sitting down. One guy was down in the floor on his knees. I mean, I'm talking about master sergeants and sergeant and first down there barking like a dog to get out. So he said, well, we'll, we'll let him go. And I said to myself, and then I said, well, then when I got ready to get discharged, they were trying to get me to stay. I know, with your injuries and yeah, your wounds. Yeah. I'm so I'm surprised. So them guys are saying, You must have I, had a mighty fine record. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, he mentioned that record. He said, your record. I, then I asked him, what's... What about my record? So he said, you have, a, you, you have a good record. But the way he said it, the way that, you know, the way the army speaks, he said, you have a hell of a good record. That's, way, that's the way he said it. And I said, well, sir, I'm going to let somebody else come along and get that same record. Yeah. I ain't going home. I said, I think I have did my job, and I think I, I would rather go home. Well, at the last word he said, and I said, suppose you get home and set the bag down, and then get over there again rough in a, in a, in a, we we'll call you back. I, I looked at him and said, "Sir, until that day." Then I turned around and got my paperwork, cause they tried to get me to go home first and send you your discharge. No, no, I stayed. And when I left, okay. I brought my discharge with me. You know, when I left, yeah, so no, I'm gonna wait on my discharge. Your yeah. brothers that were in the service, um, the three that were in World War Two, the other brother in Korea, were any of them wounded? Uh, I think my brother Al, I think uh, he was in uh, was in the engineer. I think they got shelled, and I think he got hit in the leg uh, a little bit. But my, but the other ones, uh, they was in uh, units that was uh, a lot of them didn't get. Now my brother Bennett, now if he went with with, with his outfit uh, when they first went the engineer, they went over the. Uh, you heard of the Ryan River or whatever? They blowed that bridge up, and his his whole uh, outfit was on that. And went off in the river, and he didn't get the ship out with his outfit because he had appendicitis or something other, and that's what held timber. Oh, he wasn't on the bridge. No, no, he didn't get to go. Oh, because of his appendicitis. He was in the hospital. He had appendicitis. His I outfit think you have a very lucky family. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, th I think you had, think you had more than luck with you. Let me. Uh, everybody, everybody sees my paperwork. They, they, they want to hide that now. Spencer Dixon, I knew you. He told you about what happened to him, did you, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I had a nephew who was in a was in Vietnam. He 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 had uh, he was he was uh, assigned as with the MP. He 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 was was assigned to stay with the general at all times. Mm -hmm. So some guy talked to me and trying to get one of them dogs, and said if you take if you get one of those dogs, say you can go on a trip. You can go to Hawaii or anywhere you want to go in, a, and then when you come back, you have one of them dogs. And when he he went on and went on on a trip and went, they went to Hawaii and then when he went back to Vietnam, he met a guy in the Hawaii and he said, he would tell him what he's going to take up when he go back. With my, that guy told him, don't you do that. He said, man, all those guys with the dogs got killed. Mm -hmm. He went and took that trip and went back and told him, said, well, I changed my mind. Mm -hmm. So he stayed with that Hawaii and that general anyway, the building got blown up uh, and they was coming out of that again in, in the Jeep. The building got blown up, and the the general got killed. He got he got he got well, he got uh, wounded. My nephew did also, and uh, then he went on and stayed his time. When his time was up, he got on. He come on out of that too. Mm -hmm. Now the news. Now my nephew, and he got back. He was in the navy six years. He got back to San. You know, he was ever long about the Vietnam time. He came back to California, and, and when he got there, and he. He was uh, behind his education. He got a good job and stayed. Then he called me the other night in, in reserve, Navy Reserve. He said, man, they're finna get us all. I said, what, I said, what do you mean? Going to call him up for Iraq. I said, well, when, when do you think you'll go? He said, I have to be in Alaska Sunday. I said, I have to be in Alaska Sunday. No, Monday. I'm supposed to be there Monday, Monday morning in Alaska. Man, said, well, then I said, well, is that the place you're going to Alaska and not uh, Iraq? He said, yes, right now. I said, we're going to go there and, and uh, protect the, and the, don't they have a lot of pipelines? Mm -hmm. Right now, that's what they're going to do. But something else come up. See, I was looking at that. 
at the Coast Guard, uh, they tried to uh, ambush a guy on a boat. And I thought about him. I said, oh, my goodness. So he, he's going to be at me in Alaska Monday. Mm -hmm. I said, I'll declare. And then I have another, uh, 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 my, my niece's son, he's already gone to Iraq. Mm -hmm. See, I got, I got, I, I, I had him, he wanted to get out of there. Every time something would happen, he'd be the first one to go. So he'd come and sit and talk with me and ask me what could he, how could he. I said, okay. I said, what you do? You go back and talk to a chaplain. And this chaplain will, will, will refer you to, uh, to get your MOS changed. Out of that, what you're in. And that worked good. But they didn't. wasn't. They, I don't care who he was in. They still sent him. He went to. He went to Iraq. He's gone now. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Let me back up to some of these questions um, that we didn't touch on. Maybe expand on them a little bit. Uh -huh. uh, were you able to stay in touch with your family while you were in Korea? On on a letter. Just letters. Which I think. Which I look at it now. Where they're doing that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't prefer all of that. Oh, you mean. Uh, the way they're doing now. See now, we had a, we had a movie, a whole a movie thing come up there. Go uh, make a movie, and uh, we just told uh, we with just cameras told cameras and camera. Things. We just told them no, 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 no. So we are in trouble. Here we don't need this. So the the guy just told them y'all just leave. So and then told them to hold it. Said, so I want you to take our information back to America. We are short of ammunition. We were we were short of ammunition. Well, that's one of the questions. Um, did you have plenty of supplies? Sometimes you didn't. We were limited. We couldn't. We couldn't just waste uh, ammunition at night. Mm -hmm. Just make sure that everything is uh, that what you use is good use. But after that guy left and come back to America, about uh, I said three weeks time. We had, yeah, one guy said, well, he did get the message back. He did. Get yeah, it. he got the message back. He sat there and I just writing when they, when they was telling him. And, uh, but you didn't like having media and journalists along with you. No, no, we, we didn't have, we didn't have, we just didn't have time for that. Okay. We, but you did write to your family? Uh, yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you, were you able to receive letters yeah, from them? Yeah, we would get, would get our letters because see what happened. The, the mail clerk would come from the rear up to the foxhole and sit there. All day he'd have sometime envelopes because what we had was rain and get wet. We didn't have nothing to write, nothing. He'd come up and bring and sit right there and say, all oh, y'all just go on and write to your parents. See, when you, you get your envelope and put your letter down and you write up in the right hand corner free. Mm -hmm. We don't we worry about it on not stamp. He said, you want to get a money order fixed out and sent back? He said, hey, he said, I'll do all of that. And he'd sit right there. One time, it was a funny thing. He got up there and uh, while the guy on the machine gun was uh, writing his letter, he went over there and got on the machine gun was just fine. And so I said, look at y'all, the mail clerk. Yes, sir. So I said, look, that's that guy here. I said, he's a real guy. I said, he, he tell the guy to go on and write your letter and I'll take over. Well, but, but he leave that before sun go down. He walked. Mm -hmm. Walk all the way from there. He could get ambushed any kind of way on his way back, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, a lot of times, yeah, we uh, were short of uh, ammunition a whole lot of time. And, and then our food supply, it would get cut off. We went three days with nothing. Mm. Three days because everything got cut off. And when we did get to play where we could eat, well, then all you had was sea ration mm -hmm. in them cans. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason I wasn't hungry, when you when you were really hungry, when them rounds come in, that, that was your appetite. <laughs> you lost that your was, appetite. There you go. That was your that was your appetite right there when them rounds come in. Oh my gosh! And uh, what about uniforms and shoes? Uh, well, boots and, and no, dry socks. No, we would Did go. Have... We'd go sometime a whole month, you know. But I I never remember looking at a. It wasn't no real mirrors. A piece of some you could see your face a little bit. I hadn't shaved in over a month. I said, if my people see me like this now, they would see you. Uh, dust and you sweat and that all that's on drying and you and you're being out looking I didn't even know myself I said good lord I said, I said my people would see me now they wonder what in the world is going on now we had the quartermaster would come up so far with a big truck with a uh, shower on that thing you go down and he put down boats and then you find he put down what you know boats for you to walk on you oh, stand okay. on oh, okay. and then you turn the shower on yourself and take a shower and then 
and then he'd give you uh, dry clothes clean, then he'd give you two extra pair of uh, socks, and you did have some extra pair of socks, but like I said, when it rained, everything get wet. You still ain't no, I mean, it's not no better off. Uh, and and uh, cause I talk to people now, that's uh, said that, but they didn't get nothing like that. One guy was in uh, the guy that you said you went to in Woodbury. He said he went. Uh, he don't know how long. He without he couldn't even take a bath. Yeah, you know, didn't World have War II. Take, take no bath on World yeah. War Two. And then I was telling about we had the quartermaster to come up with a truck mm -hmm. and bring come up with a shower and dry clothes, and then we would get some dry clothes, which would make you feel better to get your pair of dry clothes. Cause you went out there in the rain standing. See, a lot of people don't understand. You standing in them holes up, up to around here. You standing off in mud and water. Mm -hmm. You ain't got no choice. Mm -hmm. All I used to ask myself, how in the world did I get here in this kind of situation? <laughs> <laughs> it was those friends and neighbors, wasn't yes, it, that chose you? <laughs> we're right at the end of this. Okay, we're going to get okay. this going again. One of the questions I want to ask, mm -hmm. uh, and we were touching on this, uh, how did you entertain yourselves? You didn't have a lot of time for entertainment, but what did you do with downtime? See, we would... Uh, at night when we was uh wasn't wasn't in, in uh in wasn't doing any, anything but sitting we, but you watch everybody everybody had to watch all night long then during the day since you don't sit up all night watching then when daylight come you decide you you need a nap mm -hmm. then then uh, and then other times we would uh, make sure your weapons stay clean and make it and then you would take we would take exercise just get just start running off down there and running back so one time we got fired in on taking extra running around and taking I said, we better cut this out. I said, they think we're over there joking and going on. They, they go fire at us and let us know that we, that they're still here, you know. So so there wasn't a lot of, of time to entertain no, ourselves. It wasn't no, it wasn't, no, wasn't no time. We just go to talk. Guys were just, uh, were just saying, when I get back to America, I'm going to buy me a, try to buy me a nice home and, uh, and live like a human being. He said, look at us now. We, we, we are not even... The way we are living here, it's not even, you know, human. So, and uh. So entertainment was thinking about home. That's right. So that every once in a while, they would bring up a movie close by, mm -hmm. and let a few go at a time. And I said, no, nope, no, thank you. I'm gonna sit right here. They went back there to the movie, and on their way back, they got ambushed. I said to myself, I thought I was using honest, honest, honest uh, movie star I seen over there, and that was Jack Benny. And uh, and uh, I didn't I didn't care for seeing anything else. My mind was trying to was thinking about you know trying to survive and get back home till I didn't care about you no know, uh, fudge going back seeing a movie or whatever like that. I just said I don't want to see this. Well, now, Mr. Tucker, you're uh, let's see, you went into the service in 1950. You were born in 26, mm -hmm. so you're what 24 years old. Were you, what was the age range like in the group you were with? I'm sure there were some younger, were there older? They were younger, and then they had, uh, they had older guys in World War II. Mm -hmm. Now they spoke, now they were the backbone of the younger ones that come in, you know. And uh, so we had, uh, we had some guys, that it, they was pretty well up in age, but they were World War II. Mm -hmm. But they were good soldiers. Mm -hmm. They would know, they know exactly how, how the combat, uh, Unit would uh, would be engaged in the enemy and everything, you know. Well, I had a guy that uh, uh, that would tell he was telling me in the movie. But my one thing I didn't agree with him: if a round hit here, he said go and jump in that hole. But we was taught better than that in, in basic training that it was a few inches off and it could hit right close again. And I just told the guy, I said, no, that's wrong. Then the next round was fired. It hit almost right by the. And the, and the guy turned around and looked at me. He said, "Well, you guys, so they must give you all good training, tell you how to how to do these things." I told him, "Well, we were told not to ever jump in a in a hole where around and hit, you know, made a hole, get in there." So I, we didn't do that. And uh, yeah, those older guys uh, were really uh, were were really doing a good job. But the biggest thing that that got me, we had this old sergeant. He would tell me one day. He said. Uh, he said, I have some alcohol. My leg is hurting me. He said, would you mind rubbing my leg? And the alcohol said, we had a big holes dug out there, and we was back here. And in case the rounds come in, you go and jump in the, 
Oh, so I rubbed him down good and everything, and just before I got through, uh, here comes the enemy rounds in. And everybody started running and jumping them holes, and I, I don't know what I did with it. I just dropped, the, I guess, the alcohol bottle and took off and got it down myself. So then I got to thinking, I says, uh, I said, we left uh, Sergeant Randolph out there. I said, his leg was bothering him, and he couldn't, he couldn't run. Then after the shelling was over, we went back. I went right back out to look for him and didn't see him. I said, "Where?" And everybody was getting, getting, was coming out of the hole. And you, you know what? That, that, that guy was at the bottom of the hole. He was the first. Come out, run everybody. And then he looked at me and started laughing. He said, "If you think I can't run, you try me." And I, I stayed mad with that guy for a long. I used to be out there walking down the road, and he'd be coming, and I would fix the stop and turn and go back. And he said, "Wait a minute." He said, "You still mad at me?" Cause because because you give me some really running uh, strength, I told him, man, I said I wouldn't have believed that, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Sergeant Randall, he was from he's from he always talked about California. He was from he was from California, and um, so those old uh, older guys really really knew uh, about comeback, mm -hmm. and I was glad I was glad that we had some mm -hmm. like that. Oh. We were talking about how cold it was. And the rain and things. How did you deal with all that? Was it cold the whole it, time it, you it, were there? It, it was no. It, it, at, at, way after April, last April it started warming up some. But other than that, it's. How did you deal with that? It, I, I don't. Just have to try to put up with it in any kind of way. You, know? you Did you have shelter? No, 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 no. You had no shelter. Cause once you, once you are a front line person, all you got is a hole, and you try to find some, maybe a dough. Off a building, put that over. Oh, oh put yes. that over your hole, but you still got it. You still got it open there where you can see. Mm -hmm. Try to dig it deep enough and, and pull that over over the top over the top of your hole, well, and that'll help you a little bit. Gave you, know. you a little bit of warmth. And because you couldn't, because you couldn't make no fire. You couldn't. No, and uh, cause like I remember a guy lighting a, a cigarette. That's one thing they teach you in basic training. You don't a light travels. You could see a light all the way. Don't ever strike a match. Uh, light up a cigarette or because one guy lit up a, I didn't think I, well I don't know whether I don't think he was the infantryman they just put you in pull him out of anything and put you in the infantry because he said he had never fired an M1 and I said well how did you get here he said he just told me had me a rifle said go get him you know so he lit that cigarette and I turned around right quick and hit that guy <clears throat> and knocked that cigarette out of his out of his mouth right quick he said what's wrong I said you don't like no cigarette wasn't long no sniper start firing at night now, now that's really bad at night Snipers are fine. We was down at at around two in the morning. I was sitting down behind a tree root. Well, I, I knew I couldn't get hit, and that sniper fired and was right up over, over the top of my head. And what I did, I just slid it on down like I was hit. One of the guys kept on hollering, "Tucker, you hit!" I wouldn't say anything because you you're not supposed to say that, you know. And I didn't say anything until the next morning, and everybody got to look around. I said, "Do you hit me, Carl?" He said, "I thought," you know. I thought I was hard at you as you was. I told him, no, you don't do that. He said, they really taught you all in basic training how not to, told me we told not to say nothing. Just slide out like he was hitting and lay there. Then uh, some guy got to hollering for uh, Sergeant Randolph. You don't, you don't, you take off your rank. You don't give nothing. Uh, you don't call people for no rank or no nothing. So this guy made a mistake and hollered Sergeant Randolph. And the enemy up there just as good as you can hear him say, here I am up here. Sergeant Randolph finally spoke up. He says, little old soldier, here I am over here. You can go on up there if you want to. That was the enemy saying, you know, here I am. But you see, a lot of them can speak English. But I, I talked to a few that uh, they was, no, knew more about Chicago than I did. You know? Well, I was going to ask you that. Did you have the opportunity to interact with any of the people there in the country, whether they be the enemy or whether they just be people in little towns that you went through? Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of what them. What was that like? Oh, it was uh, what I was angry about. That he was speaking uh, English almost as good as I was. He, the enemy. Yes, yeah, so he went. He went to. Uh, he went. He was in Chicago. So he went to school. So he was. Say, like he was sitting behind a car. So y'all got them cars. He said, "I'm riding." I said, "I look class." So here's a guy. He doesn't. He know much about American, American as I do. And uh, so, yeah, we had a lot of guys that uh, that knew a whole lot about American and could speak. Uh, that you take the interpreter. We had his name of Ann Loson, and he could. He could speak English. I think he had been to California, and uh, and uh, he was uh, he was one of our, our interpreter. But he was with the South Koreans, so. 
but he, he got a chance to come to America and you know, go to school. And, uh, now, he, he was really a true guy. He, you could ask him anything, and he'd tell you about anything. And uh, So one day, uh, we were lined up. The kitchen finally got a chance to come up close to bring us some food. Mm -hmm. And uh, he set up everything, and we lined up there to eat. So this uh, South Korean happened to look around and, and grab this guy and said, I said, hey, hey, what you doing? He said, he's the enemy. Then we had the enemy standing off the line, getting ready to eat. My goodness. I said, oh, my goodness. How in the world did he grab him? And did he have on an American uniform? No, he had on, on, on a uniform like the South Korean. Oh. Sometimes they had on, you know. Okay. And you, had to, and you had to watch that, and you had to kind of watch the little pets sometimes they, or, or, that they were wearing. And uh, but we were already under artillery fire, as uh, mortify anyway, at the kitchen. Cause this big cook, he had that old big old pot of coffee. You talking about some bad coffee? <laughs> and a round come in and hit. And well, I had my tray. I went over and cut me a piece of that bread off and get some of the old powdered eggs. And then that cook took off running and hit that pot of coffee and knocked it over. And we stand up by laughing at him. And uh, he said, "You guys got to be crazy." He said, "To the man that round hit way out there." So when it hit right on you, he said, "You better, you better be saying I, I." I, I uh, I don't see how I, let, I got away from America in a way to get way over here. He, that guy got mad at us and told us, well, he said, I won't never bring no more food up here. You all say, you guys are laughing at me because I run and knock that pot of coffee over, running, trying to, you know, keep from getting hit. Mm -hmm. He told him, man, we get this every day. He said, sometimes you, you can almost imagine how far the round is going to land sometime. And I just went on and got my food. Then I went on and got down behind a, a place in the side and eat. Mm. But that, that cook wasn't kidding either. He, he didn't come back up there. He'd come up five miles and tell you to come get it. You had to walk back. You had to leave some of the guys there. they go and eat sometimes. you get ambushed coming back. they come back. One time I didn't go. I just said, well, I'm just going to do without. I'd rather not go way back and eat. And then you had to walk all the way back up, you know, so. It sounds like to me that you had some really good basic training. Oh yeah, it was. Because you, gotta, you refer to it often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, out of that 16 week basic training, because I come to command, uh, he was a captain, uh, Who? captain, uh, captain uh, squire. He was from, uh, he was originally from Birmingham, Alabama. He was really a nice guy. He going to make sure that his men get the best of training. Even though, now that was strange. When we were sent out of that to go to Korea, we all stand in line, we'll, Wondering where are we going? And I'm standing out there with my finger crossed. And they, I was saying, I hope I don't get an uh, order saying uh, F E C O N. That was Far East Command. F E C O N. Uh, they hollered my name out. Told me Far East Command. I said, Oh my goodness. I said, I know I didn't want to go. Do you know that guy with uh, the captain? Had, had, they had sent him in, into Korea. And do you know he had gotten wounded and came back on the plane uh, with us? They had him in a. Oh, the captain that did your basic training? Right. Oh, okay. We didn't even know that. The, we thought they were going to, you know, he's going to stay and do basic training. You know, uh -huh. the, the next uh, cycle had come through. Uh-huh. And they had him in a, in a thing up to his waist. A body cast? And when they get ready to get him, they'd pick him up and carry him in a, yeah. Oh, my So he got ripped with a, one of them burp guns. And just from his leg all the way up to almost to his waist. Mm -hmm. I said, well, good. And also, then we have a. We have one more guy that uh, uh, that we still keep in contact with each other. He lives in Kentucky. He comes to see me, and I've been to see him a couple of times. So. Well, I wanted to ask you, friendships that you formed, were there, were there any people that you knew going into this? Any people from your hometown? Anyone that you knew, or were you alone? No, I didn't know anybody. So you formed... Just the group, the group that we went from basic training. Mm hmm we were real close. We just, just, you know, like, you're like brothers, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Well, you didn't know anybody. But you, you formed new friendships. Yes. Uh huh. Have you maintained those? So far, I've made, I've, I've, I've maintained, but uh, uh. And I'm sure just some of them. But yeah, I mean, do you uh -huh. see some of the, some of the boys that you served with? Yeah, I met uh when I was in Michigan. I ran across, across quite a few of the guys. You really. Know. And in, 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 uh, in Michigan, and then one guy, like I say, he's in Kentucky. He comes to see me, and then I goes to see him. And, and do you uh, belong to? Uh, do you belong to uh, 
veterans organizations where you would see them, or does your unit have, uh, do no, the men of your unit have reunions? You know, I wish I could have went to the third division unit. It was a long time before I knew that was that was going on, because I, I was, was wanting to see some of the other guys. Mm -hmm. But I seen about five of the guys in Michigan when I was going. See, when I went, uh, when I, uh, I went to Michigan, uh, I had lived there before, and then uh, to when go you got to, out of the service to go to school. Okay. Uh, I went, I went back. Uh, the, the Nashville VA says, oh, anywhere you want to go, we'll send you. In anywhere in the country you want to go." I said, "Well, to I just school." Didn't. Yeah. Okay. I said, I, "I said, well, let me go back to Michigan. See what happened. What happened here in Tennessee? Uh, I was to go to Memphis. To go, and I got there, and it was." Uh, they had put a lock on on the door and them closed it down. Then I went back and reported it back to Nashville. They said, "Well, that's all right. We'll we'll let you go anywhere you want to go." And I, so I went on, on I went on to Michigan, and then that's when I and when I was in this school, it was quite a few of the guys came. I went to barber school, mm -hmm. and uh, there the barber school was downtown, and I just happened to be sitting there, wasn't busy in my chair, barber chair, and when and then walked some guy, and I kept looking, and they looked at me and. And the guy was, one of the guys was our mail clerk. See, what he would do would come up there and sit and sing us some songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you and he could, that. Yeah, he could sing good and sing us songs. So when he come in that school, that was the first thing I heard him to say. The, the instructor said, all oh, right, we ain't going to have too much noise over there. And he'd be singing, sing, you know, singing the songs. And then, uh, and then uh, two or three more guys came in in the school. Mm -hmm. Then I got to talk with them, and I said, well, good Lord, I'm running, running into some of the some of the guys that are with uh, in Korea. No, I was wishing it would have been some that uh, maybe it was best it wasn't. Uh, so that was kind of be a hard fitting one of them get killed, you know. Mm -hmm. But I tell you what did uh, happen in Korea. We I had a a guy with red from Muffy Bubbles in in the uh, MP outfit in Korea. Do you know we rode each other backwards and forward? The mail guy would bring the mail up and then he'd go back and carry him the letter from me and then we got the writing that he decided that. Uh, if I wanted to change and come to be an MP in his place, and he'd exchange and come in my place for a while. We had that thing going good, and I went and showed it to my uh, come commander. He said, well, I'm going to check into this. And he said, it's possible. But I was telling him, man, it's not no eating no cake up here. He said, I don't care. I want to release you. And uh, the last letter I wrote him, things got so bad. I just told him, look, we have known each other all our life. I said, if you don't hear from me no more, forget it. And I left it that way. Mm. You know that guy didn't hear from me no more after that. You know I got wounded after that because we was trying, we almost get we to get that uh, exchange. I go back and stay in stay in his outfit and, why, and, and let him go to the front. And that guy didn't hear from me no more. And they said he like to went nuts behind that lot. Of, I just wrote how I felt. Mm -hmm. Told him our lives are not nothing. So if you don't hear from me no more, just forget about you even knew me. That's just the way I just wrote. The letter, and he didn't hear from me. Finally, I think he wrote home after I got wounded and come back. And then they finally told him that I was back in America, so I done got wounded. And he said he just didn't know what to think. All the months, he didn't couldn't hear nothing else. You know, okay. I just had to write like I was feeling. That's just the way I was feeling. Did you keep letters? Did your family keep letters that you wrote home? Were you able to write to them? Yeah, those oh, kind yeah. of emotions. No, I couldn't write that kind of emotion. Oh, no, 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 you no. You couldn't no. let uh -uh. them know that. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. As long as he was that guy was in Korea, it was all right, you know, mm -hmm. you write whatever you want to each other in Korea, you know. Well, did was, your experience in the in the Korean War, did it impact your life after you got back into the States? You said you chose to go to barber school, mm -hmm. so you, uh, how did it impact your life? How did it impact your career choices? And Well, uh, for, uh, well, I don't think I'll see it like that. Though. I just let's leave that. <laughs> That's passing. All, all I can say that we, after doing all this, we went, you know, went away and fight, and then this mud was from. See, I had a uh, promise. See, the guys we had a lot of guys that what young men wasn't gonna fight. He said, an American would go back. He said, you go back. They tell you you can't sit here, you can't go in here. And I, I just told him, I said, look, let's clean up here, and go back home, and let's clean up. And I meant that. Mm -hmm. See, when we got back, an American, so me and some of the guys went to get on bus, sat down. They said, hey, you can't sit here. You go back. 
back. So I told the guy, I said, look, if you don't have respect for me, uh, please have it for my uniform. So we had some big sergeant who walked up and asked me, he said, what, what, what happened? He, I said, he was saying something about you couldn't sit here. So the guy was wearing a purple heart like I was. He just told the guy, I said, we are uh, American and we are went and fought for our country. And now we got to hear this. He said, I'm not going to hear it. So you, so you get back there. And so the guy went on back and went on back and said, we, uh, we had quite a few uh, misunderstandings. And a lot of time I wouldn't even go to town on account kind of that, uh, that because I didn't want to. A lot of times if you get in trouble, you, you really get uh, kicked out of service, you know, and I just, I just preferred that I, I mean, it was bad to feel that way because, see, uh, I'm a guy who felt free ever since I was growing up because our father taught us that God created one man and one woman. So I want you to be good kid and don't, don't start thinking about nothing else about life. That is the way things is, and that's the way it always will be. And, you know, I listened to that, and uh, I thought about that, and I said, well, I'm really glad that I, uh, my father told him to go. Uh, we have people using, want to use names and names and names. And I, I mean, a lot of time, I, you know, would laugh, but I used to tell them, long you don't say it direct in my face, I says, uh, I don't have no, I don't, I don't, I mean, you can say what you want to say, long you don't say it di uh, direct. And uh, even, even all the way, even when I come home, I had one of the almost the worstest time coming from Nashville to Murfreesboro. But did you, you didn't experience, did you experience that kind of thing while in the service? We had it in service too. You did? See, we had guys there, uh, but that was a funny thing. See, we had guys from everywhere, so, uh, you well. You lived through some changing times. They didn't understand me how I could conversate with everybody with a smile. Then I said, there's a soldier. I said, now, I don't know where you're from, and I killed this. I said, now, we are all in this together, because the company man of them told us, I'll see, they don't give you the do's and don't. There. Mm -hmm. And this guy, these guys stand out there in front and tell you what they didn't want. Oh, I said, whatever you have in mind, you believe sick. Or when I look down the line uh, in, with all you soldiers, all I see is one. So, see, I had, I had told some guys that. I said, I, I only see one soldier. And this guy come back and repeated to me, he said, you told him, you told us that, that everybody is, is just one soldier. I said, that's all, that's all one soldier. I said, all of the other I said, we're here to get training and, and uh, do what we're supposed to do and then, and then try to get back out in life again. And, uh, so I had no problem because the way I was, mm -hmm. see, I was raised up, I was raised up with everybody. We played together. Mm -hmm. We all, I, I, I had no uh, you know, n no uh, regrets about uh, that. So some of the guys told me, said, well, says, uh, can I go to the canteen with you to, down to the, we, you know, you go down to the canteen in the army. I said, yes, so y'all come on. He said, our parents taught us the wrong thing about this, that, and the other. I said, well, you, I, said, I want you to make sure you write back and call them and tell them, said, we all are one soldier and just tell them that we, you, we get along just fine. The, um, 15th Infantry Regiment, was there a, a pretty even mix? Mm -mm. No? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I got there. I was, I was shocked but for, for what I went through with in America. And then go there. And I, I never did question it. I just wondered what, in a long run, but, but our officers was uh, Caucasian. Mm -hmm. And some of the medics, mm -hmm. most of the medics, Car crazy. That, so that's all we had uh, with the medics and and the uh, uh, company commander and, the, and then all of the other officers under him was uh, was uh, uh, Afro American. So and uh, so I he, never paid no I never I never I never paid no attention to one time. Uh, we was in a spot facing the enemy and it was it was pretty. And that was supposed to be, it was uh, was going to be one of the toughest. Round was gonna have, you know, with the enemy. We there, we was facing them, but something went wrong. The enemy shift out of out of our position. I know you heard of the first cav, cav, mm -hmm. the guy with the horse patch. Mm -hmm. They all were shift over and went in and went and got in and got uh and went after the cavalry. So I asked the, one of the guys what happened. He said he looked down and 
seeing us, they said, we're not going to face them people. So them people to do away with us. Talking about that, you know, the Afro-American. Well, was, your, was your regiment primarily Afro, African-American then? Most. M mostly. But not here in America. But not here in America. Not here in America. No, oh, no, no. Oh, but you no. said when you got to oh, Korea. When I got to Korea, I, I, that's why I was shocked. Oh, no, we got to South Carolina. They, uh, I had a deck of color. They got that guy looking at me. He said, what in the world is that? He said, what are you doing? I said, it's a black one, a red one, a black one. Real and thought nothing else about it. Mm -hmm. I, that's what I was, you know, trying to tell them about how they are, how they, mm -hmm. how they are mixing. I never said no this. I know that I said, said a black one, a real, a real one. They said. So it's a good mix. Here it was in, a good mix in, in the United and, States, and it was spelled out. But when you got to Korea, here in South Carolina, it was spelled out. The same guy, I come to mind, uh, uh, Captain Squire. He just told him, I'm not going to have all of this. I never went for it. He said, I have. We all are soldiers, and you're gonna be treated like soldiers. And then that's then the first sergeant out there. He, that said, he went on to tell what, what he been out here, what would happen if he if he did hear it. And I said, well, that sounds good. I said, cause I'm I'm here to get training and mm -hmm. and do what I want to do. I ain't got time for nothing else. And then but then we had a few sergeants there. Sergeant Dittmar, he forgot. He slipped up. We was cleaning our weapons. And he says, hey, you are a white boy, you come over here. Hey, you colored boy, you come. One of the guys said, uh-oh, you are in trouble. Went down and went to the, went down that, and went to the first sergeant and they called him to come in down there to the, uh, all the room. And we know that thing, that Korean war was hot. He had got busted up uh, one of his uh, stripes and then, Gave orders to Korea. Their yeah, war was hot. Well, they don't. They don't want them. Not that. Don't come with that. Well, I guess. I guess it was a changing time because in World War II, everything had been separated, and so they're they're trying mm -hmm. to make it work. Mm -hmm. I guess. So I guess they were watchful and mindful. You know what like I always said, I, I don't see a way it could have been any problem, you know, in the beginning. You know, that, that, that's the way I thought. I said, mm -hmm. I don't see how in the way. I said, I just feel like I feel from day one to day now, I like to mingle with all people from, now you take our organizations that we are, we are sometimes I'm the only one that you can't hardly hear nobody but me. And everybody, we just get along just, mm -hmm. just fine. You know. We've come a long way. That's We've right. We've learned a lot. So I just, I just, you know, I, I just enjoy it, but I don't, I just didn't. I just didn't have time for that. I all I wanted to get me a, a good job and and and, uh, and and try to have something what I wanted, and I just didn't have time for. Now the GI for, Bill, were you able to use the GI yeah, Bill? Yeah, yeah, that's what I that's when I went to school. Mm -hmm. you know. That made a big difference GI for Bill, a lot made, of people, didn't it? Made a big difference uh, there too. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, it was a whole lot of things. So see, now when I went to school, uh, there uh, the uh guy over the school, uh, he quite, he must not, didn't understand the veterans, uh, see, if some get sick, he had, a uh, he had it fixed where if you out three days in a row, he would terminate you, and then maybe could pick you up, maybe next six or months or a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I came along and had the pneumonia. I go downtown to the VA representative, the guy was representing me. He told me, he said, you got two choices. You, do you want to go to the hospital or do you want to stay at home? Go to the doctor and let him give you your medicine. I said, I, I said, I, I'd rather stay at home. So after the pneumonia got over, I stayed. I was out, let's see, about 16 days, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. Well, I went back downtown to the VA. He said, okay, you're ready to go back in. I said, all right. He wrote out everything that you were ready to return. I go on back over there to the school. And the guy comes over and says, uh, well, I tell you what, says, uh, sick or no sick, we only allow three days out and and we, we have to drop you and maybe we can pick you up in six months or maybe another year. Well, I said, well, okay, you know, we should be standing here saying anything. So I left and went back downtown. Mm -hmm. I went back downtown, was a, a different picture was drawn on for as for as a me a veteran, so the guy asked me says how was everything? I told him it wasn't. He said what happened? I said they told me brother you sick or no sick. Everybody in that school they have been dropping them. 
after three days and they don't pick you up no more in a year or six months or a year. He said, no, they can't do that. So you are a public law 16 veteran. Can't nobody touch you. I didn't know that. See, I'm, I'm a public law 16 veteran. So can't nobody touch you. He said, well, come on, tell me all the rest of it. And I told the guy, told him, told him, well, he went away and got his coat. Big heavy set guy got his coat and got his bag and put some more extra things in his bag. He said, we're going back down there to that school to see what the situation is all about. Well, we goes on back and he parks and get out and he said, you go on in first and I'll be on in. I went on back in there and was standing around. I heard, I could hear some of the students say, I thought they, I thought they told him to go home and not to come back no more. So. Directly, the guy walked in. Then come on into school. He went up and asked the, the secretary, "Where is the? Uh, I want to see the owner of this of the school that's over the school." She says he's back there. And then the secretary kept looking out there at me, like looked like she was getting angry that I knew that something had gone wrong, and that something was going to happen to them there in that school, you know. So she told him, "Said he's back there in the back." So he went on back, and talked to him a while, and directly the guy come back and. and uh, Let me turn this. You were so, telling me about uh, the so, school. Yeah, so the guy went back and and came back out and begged for me to come on back. They in the back went in the office back there, and I went on back. So the guy sat there, and, uh, the VA representative sat there and joked a while and joked a while, and he said, "Now let's quit joking and get out to business." I said, "I said, I wonder what, you know what?" So he went on to tell the guy about his policy. Your policy don't meet our policy. They said, this veteran here is a public law 16. He went on and started quoting the law about this public law 16 veteran. He said, now we didn't send him all the way from from Tennessee to here to go to this school to be put out of school. So our attention that he uh, finished school and go and get him a job so he can, can be comfortable and live comfortable. Mm -hmm. So well, the guy sat down, he looked, and I know anything. This, he said, now, you, in a way, said, your school could be in trouble. Mm -hmm. He said, but I'm going to the rest that you have did like this. He said, but I'm going to concentrate on this veteran here because he's a public law 16 veteran. Our attention of him to graduate and, and go out and get him a job. And we're not going to, and we're going to stay behind him until that day comes, so when he, until he graduates. So he was sick, had a pneumonia, and said, we stand behind our veteran when they're, when they're sick. So uh, then he told me, he said, go back and punch your card. Uh, punch your card, Mr. Uh, Tucker, and go on back out there. Some guy had my chair. And I said, hey, I said, move all your stuff out of here. I said, you in my chair. So everybody was saying, what happened? Did I thought they, you know. So after I went back and sat down, and the representative come back and stood in front of me and I looked at his watch. He said to me, "Say you thought they did you wrong." Say I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you what I'm fixing to do. He said, "As of now, you are dropped by me." Stood there a while. I said, myself, "I'm just thinking. I wonder what." Then he looked at his watch again. He said, "As of now, you are back in, you are back in school and start right, start right." He said, "Now you will get paid from the time you was out of the time you were sick out. Back, come back up to date. You." So he said, you'll be paid back on backup date. I said, well, I don't know what in the world is it? He said, and I said, now, everything has been taken care of. So you go ahead on and finish, and graduate, and, and go to the board, and then get, and then, then you'll be ready to get your job. You know? mm -hmm. Everybody was wondering, what? And I said, I've been put out, and I didn't, couldn't come back in a year. I said, well, I, don't, I told him, I don't know. I said, I said, my representative, I said, he's standing behind me. And uh, I think the owner, he got kind of angry about it, but he wasn't, he wasn't no angry. He just come back and mm -hmm. told me he was sorry this happened, you know. So when I got started getting my pay, I'd get a check every month. I went to the mail box and get the mail out, and I lay five checks. I said, what in the world is this man? It wasn't, a, it one was under, a little under a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. I said, what did this man, what did he do? He told me that I was gonna, you know, get the get the results of, but but you know, by being sick, mm -hmm. and that so that's so that's what I went on graduated. I got my little 
car that you get the grading and you know I had not had more E's than I had B's on my on that on that car. Cause then when I went to the board downtown to try to go to the to go to the board and uh ain't had no problem with the board and you, you pay a fee to go and you didn't wanna you know, not pass the board and then, then you have to take it over again and wait for so many months and you go back again and pay another fee. Now this is to be a a barber? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. That board. That's right. Yes. A, okay. The barber board. So uh, I went on down and passed everything. and But uh, I was tickled. It was a question asked. What is a what is a bone? What is a? Bone. Uh -huh. You know, like a bone. And, uh -huh. and the guy would say, what in the world? I said, I, all I could tell him, it was in the book. See, I, I really read I really read that book and kept all that in my mind. Mm -hmm. A bone, uh, the answer for a, what is a bone a bone is a hard tissue forming the framework of the body. That's a 10 point all day. They want to know how did you get that? I said, it's in the book. <laughs> and uh, so I passed and passed everything and got everything out of there. And you, then you have to do a, a practical job. You have to give a shave and give a haircut. So this other guy had this other guy. He was this guy had this guy laying down in his chair from Canada. He was a Caucasian. He was going to school too, but he was from Canada. And he had this guy shaving him. He done cut that. I was bleeding that uh, inspector looked over there at him and said, asked him, where'd you? So you must have went to a slaughter school. And I was getting through and everything. And he looked at me and said, well, that guy, he said, look like he said, he's getting through. And everything was passed. I passed on. You know, I talk with the women, the, the nurses. You know, it's a, you know they, they go before the boat. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a big time uh, uh, talking with them at the VA hospital. See, I worked at the VA hospital also. I mean, I, I quit barbering and went. I say you can't beat up for Sam. You better I go back and join him because I didn't have the best of insurance, mm -hmm. health insurance. So I went put down the barber shop and went and, and went and, and went to the uh, went to uh, the VA and got a job and went to work. Mm -hmm. So and you know how many out, years did you work? For? Eighteen. I said you know talking with them nurses about the boat. You know that's the best thing, and they were just shocked. Uh, you know well tell them about uh, the boat. Uh, you know I went to and. We we had a big time since a lot of them went to was in Springfield, Ohio, and some of part of Ohio. They went to the Bowwood, and I was just telling them we was talking about the Bowwood. That was a good conversation. Be talking about going before the Bowwood, you know. Mm -hmm. and when you go there, you better be ready, cause uh, if you don't pay, you just don't pay. But now when I come to Tennessee, went to Nashville to the Bowwood. So in Detroit, if you can't spell like onychomycosis, if you can't spell it, just write it out and they'll know what you're saying. But Nashville was was a uh, was just either true or false or yes or no. That was the easiest. I said, myself, this is the easiest test I'm gonna ever take. <laughs> so I got my master bibles from Tennessee also. Mm -hmm. That was that was it was just a easy, uh, to me it was easy. But in Detroit, that's the other I said, if you're not ready, you just you just won't make it because they are, they got they got all that stuff up there. But it's in your book. You read your you read your manuals that that, that they give you. And I really studied that because I, I, I didn't have time to go anywhere but uh, try to study. So I learned how to barber and everything, and I, I made good of that. And I enjoyed that for a while, and then I got tired, and I just said, I think I'll go somewhere else, you know, because uh, I need some uh, some health insurance. And I was glad I went. So after 18, even close to 18 years, I had this, uh, had this heart attack. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know I had no heart attack. I done got off from work. At night and and started down the hall and uh, I was up front there where the uh, is that the local VA here out in here. Mm -hmm. I was up front there where the director they would prefer me to be in that area to work mm -hmm. and everybody wonder why see I was just good conversation with I don't care if you was a doctor did you ever know a doctor named Doctor Tenpenny Mm -hmm. I think he died a while back. Do you know, the, just to look at him, he had a look like a frown on his face and never. And some guy seen me him coming down the hall, and we was talking. He was see he was he liked baseball, and I was laying it on him, and he was just laughing. One guy called me afterwards. We quit talking. He said, "How in the world can you make that man smile?" <laughs> I said, "You have to get to the conversation that people like." Mm -hmm. He said, "That man don't say nothing to anybody." And I looked, and you and him just. Coming down the hall, just laughing and talking. And when this doctor got sick and went to the hospital, the hospital, I went to see him, and he was so glad to see me. And we, and then eventually, uh, he died. You know. Well, 
Mr. Tucker, I think you're a real people person. I, 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 that I tried, comes uh, across. Uh, yeah. That comes across. Mm -hmm. I appreciate so much that you've shared this. Let's, is there anything else you'd like to add to, to this veteran story? Uh, I'm going to pause this. And do you recall the first day in Sarah's? I do. There was a whole lot of things went on. <laughs> what was that first day like? Did it kind of scare you? No, no, it, uh, no. I was just, I was just, uh, I don't know why I was just together. I was just, when, when you go to, when you got down there to the camp, uh, uh, we got there, I think, four in the morning. They lined us all up and told us, drop everything because they will give you a physical. Oh, my. We had guys that was trying to, not to, didn't want to, and it didn't bother, didn't more bother me. And I, when I seen that, I laughed. that's why I laughed about when it says, oh, do you remember the first day in service? Because I was just said, I'm, I just looked at myself as a man, and I'm going to act like a man. So mm -hmm. we used to pull off, drop everything. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mind that at all. And uh, uh, the, the only thing, uh, the only thing that I felt a little bit about about that about this what I just said is uh, now when I got wounded and and then they got, got back in America and I went to the hospital in the Brooks Jones Hospital and uh, it was my time to go down and see they took skin graft off my leg to, to dress my wound I went down I had my jumpers and things on and I went laying on the bed and rolled me down there so the nurse closed the door and went down there and, and uh, just went to the full of the, down there and caught me by my Jamas and pulled everything in, and I'm laying up. I, was, at, I was, felt a little bit shame. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't say anything, but the, the excuse me, just one minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next time I went down there, I went to the <laughs> canteen and got me some underclothes and put on. Then I had the pajamas and the underclothes. Oh. Then when she pulled that off that time, and she looked and laughed. She said, "You sure would." And she said, "You are ready for me this time." I said. You, you have on, oh no, I didn't steal, I didn't steal this and uh, didn't say anything, but I, I still learned better when I, when I, I was in the VA hospital out here to, in Nashville I once, and I, so the, the lady, they give you that little bottle to urine in, you know, you go to mm -hmm. the bathroom, and I went in and closed the door and looked back, and the nurse was right in there behind me, I said, wait a minute, you, she said, I'm a nurse, we are trained to this, I want to make sh sure that everything go well to, in this, in this job, and I said, then I just used, then I just thought to myself, well, I said, well, you people got a job. To do you know just me feeling like that uh you know say anything about about that because they have a job to do just like the job that you'd had to do that's right that's right i'll and let uh, you look at those and see if you see something else that reminds you oh uh, I believe everything. Have we covered everything? I've covered everything, I believe. So I'm just, uh, as my life up now, I'm just kind of, you know, enjoying because I raise the garden every year, and uh, I enjoy doing that. Well, it's uh, about that time of year to get mm -hmm. started on it. And then my, and my daughter has this uh, chow dog. I goes, I goes over every day and put him in my, feed him and put him in my truck, and we go out to the Oakland Park out there, and we walk. That dog want to go all the way across that park, too. He's one of those mean dogs, so I just, so he looks for me every day when I come turn the corner. You know, he'll come, he's already running up and down the fence. That, that's how well he knows that truck. You know, so, did you, uh. Well, I appreciate more than you can ever know your mm -hmm. willingness to share this. Did you have trouble talking about your experiences when you came back? I've heard people in World War II it don't say me. A lot they of people, talk about it. You know, the women at the VA would get me and, and uh, tell me, come, let's sound, uh, say, come and eat lunch with us and, and let's just talk about, uh, I'm, we want to hear about your uh, Satora inquiry. And I enjoyed that. And a lot of the people would uh, look at me and said, uh, everybody looked like they lacked him. Said this, that, so. I said to myself, I, I don't have no problem with nobody, you know, I, I, uh, I was trying to see, give me that piece, that little, no, right there, that. Whoops. <clears throat> I was going to try to get a, a picture of this picture. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know whether you. Oh, you're going to give me, oh, that's yeah, better. Because okay. yeah, okay. I've got a glare uh -huh. on that's that. That's the I brought all that out here. I figured I was going to lift it. And uh, I had one, I thought I had some more like that made with this on that, but I, I didn't. 
I now, is this made when you went into the service? Yeah. 19, so this is 1950? Uh, uh, or, yeah. Yeah, 1950. Oh, you're so, so young. I had that. I had all that put on that headed me. I had that. Mm -hmm. They don't like that. Like that. These medals, uh, of course, the Purple Heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about it. Like you know, uh, I gave my baby sister. She was living in Cleveland, Ohio. You know, she seen when she did see me. I had Purple Heart. And she wanted to go make a bracelet and put on, you know, put, you know, put it around her neck. And you know, I didn't know. I didn't know what it was like that. And some guy seen her with that, and he told her you can't wear that. And mm -hmm. I found out you could. Uh, you know, my name is on the. These guys on, uh, at, at the in, the, in our meetings was on. I had it and showed it, and my name is in the back of that purple heart. So they yeah. said, "Well, they said, well, how in the world did that happen? They got my name in the back." So one guy asked me, "How was your purple heart presented?" I told him when I laying in the in the Tokyo hospital in Japan. I said, "High ranking officer, I looked and he was coming straight to my bed. He had that he had that uh, purple heart thing and took out took it out and read the orders and said, now I present to you uh, this purple heart." Mm -hmm. Some of the guys said, said they didn't get theirs like that. It was just, you know, they knew that they, they, it was issued to them, but not like the way it was issued to me. So, What is this medal? That's a, a brown star, the three brown star. See, I was telling you about them three uh, servicemen I saved. Mm -hmm. We had all of to leave them behind, and I went back and got them. And that's what that's this medal that, That's right. That, that's right. Did that's, you see them later? I, I haven't seen them no more. I don't know what it's from. My goodness. I really don't. My goodness. One of the name, I think, the guy that one of the name Jordan, he was, I believe he was from Florida. I, I, I never seen him no more. And I wish I could, I could have found, seen the guy that carried me back. Now, he was from out of another outfit. Come by and pick me up and put me on his back. And you know, I wrapped my arm around his neck. And then I was saying to myself, now, if I get killed, you go get killed. Cause I'm not going to turn you loose. Yeah. That's the, yeah. So yeah. I don't know who the guy was. I wish, I know he's telling people that he took a guy out in a, and, and carried him to safety. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could find I him? I wish I could. Mm -hmm. What is this medal? Uh, that one, uh, right now, it might, let's see. I'm trying to see my paper, piece of paper now before I can. Let me see here. That's the uh, uh, Korean, uh, no, it, it ain't not, it, it, I start to say it's the Korean service, service medal. Well, it must be one of these. Yeah, Korean service medal, and then the uh, now this this one here's the three is the three brown star. Uh huh. This is what it says on my and yeah, and then the then the purple heart, and then the uh, the combat infantry badge. Okay. Yeah, everybody gets one of them before round, just dropping your clothes by. Uh huh. You, you're entitled to a combat infantry badge, or uh -huh. you are. And then uh, the uh, Korean Service Medal. I don't know if that's if this one. Oh, this one's got Korea written on it. Okay, well, that's the Korean Service Medal. Well, let me show you what they sent me from. Uh, I'm sure I want you to see that. I thought that people had forgot all about us. Uh, uh, Now this is from Korea. They sent that, sent this to me. Uh, oh, okay. So it's written in Korea. Yeah. Uh -huh. Korean here, dear uh -huh. veteran. On the occasion of the, I'm going to read it onto yeah. the tape. On the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the outbreak of the Korean War, I would like to offer you my deepest gratitude for your noble contribution to the efforts to safeguard the Republic of Korea and uphold liberal democracy around the world. At the same time, I remember with endless respect and affection those who sacrificed their lives for that cause. We Koreans hold dear in our hearts the conviction, courage, and spirit of sacrifice shown to us by such selfless friends as you who enabled us to remain a free democratic nation. The ideals of democracy for which you were willing to sacrifice your all 50 years ago have become universal values in this new century and millennium. Half a century after the Korean War, we honor you and reaffirm our friendship, which helped to forge the blood alliance between our two countries. 
and we resolve once again to work with all friendly nations for the good of humankind and peace in the world. I thank you once again for your noble sacrifice and pray for your health and happiness. Sincerely yours, and it's signed Kim D-A-E-J-U-N-G, President of the Republic of Korea. How very nice. How very nice. Yeah, I was surprised to get that. Uh, That's dated June 25th, 2000. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. very nice. Mm -hmm. well, I want to thank you for sharing these yeah, okay. memories I'm, today. I'm glad, I'm this glad is a remarkable story. Oh, I enjoy this because uh, I've had some veterans say, oh, I don't even talk no more about it. It don't bother me. You was in this, so. It's a part of who you part are. Of, that's right. That's right. It's, it's not a part that anyone would choose. That's right. But it is a part of who oh, you right, are, right, right, and right. and you just have to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. uh, I appreciate yeah, okay, so I appreciate very that. much, okay. right. so very much that you. Just speaking, one of the principals told me, said, it says, she has explained to all of the students, said that he.